going to be in 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to look at um, verse 13, probably to the end. We may not get through all of it, but that's why I like to leave you hungry. I don't want to always feed you till you're full. Sometimes you might think that I do, but I don't. I'm always hoping you carry on and read a little bit beyond where we were. I'm going to look at verse 13 and following. Um, but last week, before we start, last week we talked about 1 Peter chapter 1, our living hope, right? God is our living hope. We have this inheritance that can never what? Perish, spoil, or fade. And where is it kept? It is kept in heaven for us, right? And the Bible also said that through faith we are shielded, shielded by what? By God's power until the coming of that salvation, which is ready to be revealed to us in the last time, latter days. So God has his hands around those of us who are his so that we will make it to the end, right? Regardless of persecution. Those that walk away truly have just shown themselves not to have been part of the family. God keeps us. He doesn't keep us from sinning. Somebody asked me last week, so you mean God keeps us from sinning? Don't you wish, anybody? <laughs> I wish, but that's not the case. God keeps us in our salvation to the end because those who persevere to the end shall be saved. Now, I know that, you know, like Woody will sin all the time, but no. We still continue to sin, though we should not, right? Right? I mean, honestly? Those sins that so easily entangle us should be further and further in our rearview mirror as we're driving towards Christ as we keep our eyes on the author and perfecter of our faith. Last week, we learned that uh, Christians were under persecution as this letter was written. We may find ourselves in days to come under some type of persecution. Is it happening here in America? A little bit here and there. Uh, is it happening across the globe and other places? Absolutely. People meet underground to worship the Lord Jesus. And the interesting thing is that they worship for hours upon hours. When they open up a suitcase of Bibles, people jump, jump like cockroaches on a fried chicken to get that Bible. They need it. They want it. That is their hope. Our hope is in Christ, right? And so I think what we're going to begin to see here is that persecution is coming. Persecution can happen at any moment. Nero, remember Nero from last week? He was the inventor of the Roman candle, right? He dipped Christians in tar and pitch and lit them ablaze so that they would light his garden so that he could watch you know, the flowers at night in his garden. He also blamed Christians for the burning of Rome, right? So he didn't want to take ownership. He also killed his friends. He killed his wife he killed his own family members he was just that sick in the head he persecuted christians anything to you know put the blame on someone else that was nero but through the first part of first peter we're seeing that we are called to be different right peter is saying that the reason you're persecuted is because you are different as christians as followers of jesus christ we are not of this world right we might be living in the world but we're not of this world we are in the family of god we are of the kingdom of god he has taken us and put us in his kingdom yet though we live here to be a witness for him as to something better than what this world has to offer us and so Peter is going to be telling us that the reason persecution has come your way is because you are now different than the world because you are in Christ. And we should therefore look, act, walk, talk, and be different than what the world looks like. Across the globe... Many people were watching and probably had, had uh, turned their TVs on and seen some people rising up and going into the Capitol building, right? We don't condone that, do we? I don't care who's in office, who's not in office, who's been elected, who hasn't been elected, who's in the Senate, who's in the House. As Christians, we are not to act like the world. 
The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 2 that we are to be drastically different and we are not to be fighting the same wars that the world is fighting. As soldiers of Christ, we do not get entangled in civilian affairs. We are to please the king of kings and we are to please our commander-in-chief for that kingdom, a kingdom drastically different than this world. And so what the world is screaming, we should not be screaming. Isn't that kind of strange? Did Jesus ever scream anything that the Roman Empire ever told them to, to bow down and follow? No, Jesus screamed 180 degrees in the opposite direction. Give Caesar what is due him and give God what is due him. I don't care what the world is doing. I am not of this world. I am living for the kingdom of my Father, and so shall you. Do not get entangled in these worldly affairs. Why? Because then it's hard to discern what kingdom you're living for. And we are to be set apart, holy, hagios, unto the Lord. Now, that might rub some people wrong. Well, shouldn't we rise? We should rise up for King Jesus. But if we are screaming and trumpeting what the world is screaming and trumpeting, we are serving the wrong kingdom. Just keep that in mind as we go through this. That in itself will bring persecution your way. Believe me, I've faced it. Things are happening across the globe that are tragic, yes. And we need to pray for those people of all ages, races, and genders. But we scream the truth that there is a better way. There is a different life that you could be living. And it is solely found in a hope placed and settled in Jesus Christ as your Lord and king forget about the presidents forget about the house and the senate let come what may be coming according to our sovereign lord but be ye ready because your hope is settled in jesus christ he died to give you this living hope a hope that has you on a plane ride towards heaven, heaven bound where your inheritance is kept for you by him that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Like it or not, the end is coming. In Revelation chapter 6, those saints screaming underneath, you know, those, those saints martyred for their faith. What were they martyred for? They were martyred for the fact that they stood up for the word of God. They were martyred for the word and their testimony. We are to stand solidly on the word of God and our testimony that we have been redeemed by a living and resurrected King of Kings. His name is Jesus. And to that end, we will continue to scream, Jesus, 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 even if I join the martyrs in Revelation chapter 6, which Jesus said, there must be more and more and more of these. How long, O oh Lord, they scream? And he said, until the full number of martyrs come in what does that mean there will be more people martyred for their faith and so peter wants us to be settled in our hope our hope in jesus christ amen amen let us stand to our feet we're going to look at first peter chapter one you thought i was done preaching we're gonna have open preaching day one day no <laughs> without some of you come on up 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. If you're there, say amen. 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 The Bible says, Therefore, prepare your mind. See, it's a battle for the mind. You think it's a battle against flesh and blood. It's a battle for the mind. Therefore, prepare your mind for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am 
am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each man's work impartially, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in the last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart, for you have been born again, not from perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. For all men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flower of the field. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord stands forever. And this is the word that you, or that was preached to you. Father, we thank you for this truth, and I do pray. I pray that you would conform us to your image. Holy Spirit, transform us. Help us in our desire to be set apart give us the strength to say no to this world and to the sin that so easily entangles us that we might look more and more like jesus that we can live a life worthy of our calling for your glory in jesus name amen amen you may be seated in the presence of the lord in heaven there's Pastor Jason. If you want to teach, Pastor Jason, wave your hands and hide everybody. There he is. All right. This is not your home, is what Peter's trying to tell us all through chapter 1. This world is not your home. How many of you love this world and don't ever want to depart from this place? Anybody? Come on. I've got a flash, a news flash for everybody. We are all going to die and end up somewhere eternally. We are all going to die, whether it's COVID, whether it's slip on a crack and break your mama's back, you're going to pass away, and we need to have our hope settled in Jesus Christ. Peter is telling us, make sure your hope is settled, because this is not your home. You do not belong to this place. This world should not grab hold of all your attentions, your affections, your desires. You should care less and less about this world as you live more and more and more for Jesus. And he's not just saying this as a suggestion. He's saying this because you have been filled with the Holy Spirit of God, which is opposed to this world. You should look different from the day you were saved. Your desires, so yes, you may wrestle with some things, you, you who came from wealthy families and had you know, everything that you ever wanted and everything that you wanted you got because mommy and daddy spoiled you, you might be enticed to go and play the Powerball or the Mega Millions because they're up to half a billion dollars. You might be struggling with some things, but they should be getting further and further away from you. They should not affect you like they did before you knew Jesus Christ. That's with anything across the board. You are different. You are set apart. You are called to be different. You are called to be different as a parent. You do not parent the same way the world does. You don't sit down and have an argument with your three-year-old and your four-year-old. You listen to what the Word of God says. Men of God in the workplace, you act like men of God. You come against those that want to defile and bring shame to the Lord. They want to glorify the things that he, does, that he died for on the cross to free us from. You don't entangle yourself in those things. You say no because you are called to be different. Young ones, when you're walking the halls of your school or you're out there you know, cruising up and down Milton Avenue on Fridays and Saturdays, burning up gas, I don't know why you do it, but I guess it's fun, I understand. And then you all meet up and you go do things that maybe you shouldn't do. As a Christian, as a young one, you should stand in the gap and say, you know what, I will not partake of that. This is where it ends. I will drive up and down and burn $2.17 gas all day long with you. But when you want me to go back home and drink underage or get with someone that I don't, that I shouldn't be with, I say, you know what, no. Why? Because I am radically different. In the hallways of school, you say no. No to those people that are acting ungodly. 
because that's what we are called to be as Christians, radically different and opposed. It's like oil and water. No matter how hard you shake it, you cannot get it to mix together. We need a little bit more of that in this world, don't we? We need some people that have some tenacious convictions that will say no when the world is screaming yes as a spouse when my, my i'm not saying this happens all the time because i love my you know i love my little honey over there but when we get at odds with each other <laughs> i am not called to say you know what you make me mad i hate the kids they're all driving me nuts y'all should be on a funny farm i am out of here i'm getting divorced who should not say those things we are to be radically different than the world do i say those things honestly i'm not perfect anybody ever said you know what i'm done with this i'm gonna go sleep on the couch but you don't walk out and get a divorce i'm sure we struggle with these things but christ is telling us peter is telling us you are to be radically different you don't give up on your family that i gave you as a precious gift you treat your wife like i would the church i die for her Am I preaching to myself? Amen, I am. I had a lady tell me, you know what, pastor? Pastors are perfect. Anybody perfect in this room? Woody, I thought you were going to raise your hand. He was, going, he was going like this. I almost fell over. I'm like, wait a minute. What are you wrecking my example here? <laughs> Raven was like, no. <laughs> I'm glad you guys are back, you know? <laughs> but we don't give up no one's perfect i had a lady tell me in one of my churches early on that god gives pastors a special shield so that we're not i'm like what what star trek movie you've been watching because i don't have mr sulu in my pocket that i can say shields up mr sulu the enemy's attack is coming get him off my back no i hit those trials and those temptations head on just like each and every one of you what gets me through them sometimes i fail because i'm not perfect but more than not god gets me through them if i stop for a minute and say devil there ain't no way in hell you're going to get me to fall into your trap it may take me a while you can talk to my wife but i always come around because god gets a hold of me and shakes me and says you are radically different what are you doing you don't have to whack me like that the holy spirit convicts us that we are to be radically different am i on a journey am i perfect honey come on oh. even my spouse i'm telling you folks this is a journey but it's a journey worth investing in it's a journey worth giving over to the lord to have his way with us but you have to do your part as well you can't just say well i'm, I'm a jerk i'm giving it to the lord no the lord's like you know what i've done my part i've filled you with the holy spirit of god submit to my authority that's the thing you know there's kingdom authority if you're not willing to come underneath the kingdom authority of god almighty who saved you and ransomed you bought you back from the enemy paid your penalty which he didn't have to pay died on the cross for a crime he did not commit if you cannot say yes lord to him who in this world are you going to say it to nobody a godly man will come underneath the authority a godly woman will come underneath the authority of kingdom authority god first his word what he says even though i don't like it even though my old flesh is rearing up and i want to tell my my husband off or i want to tell that person that that just cut me off in the ears i just want to tell him off god says no you're radically different and you yield to the power of the holy spirit inside of you it's not about us we are called to be radically different and so for many of us i think that the greatest obstacle or barrier or hurdle in front of us to following jesus is our desire to be accepted and fit in anybody struggle with fitting in you're a freshman in high school and you know you were the you were the the top of the one you know, the top of the mountain king in eighth grade and now you're coming into high school and you're now what on the bottom of the totem pole and they're pouring milk over your head and you just want to fit in 
and you'll do anything to fit in. But let me ask you a question. Did God call you and set you apart so that you fit in, or did he call you to stand out and look different? Nowhere in the scripture does it ever say God has redeemed you to live for yourself and to fit into this world. He has called us, redeemed us, cleansed us, commissioned us to look radically different and not blend in. You are the hope to a hurting world that is desperately looking for something different unbeknownst to them they are sick of this world are you not sick of this world even as a christian man i can't imagine what those people that don't know where are they turning for their hope what's going on we are called to be radically different what does that take it takes a settled hope what are you settling on what are you setting your hope solidly in this world and man and fitting in or Jesus Christ, even if it brings persecution. Peter's saying, have a settled hope that will help you, help you. And your hope should not be in things, but the king. It reminds me of a time, Kiowa Island, South Carolina. Anybody been to that beautiful, beautiful place, Kiowa Island? Anybody? Well, let me just tell you, it was beautiful. My Uncle Frank, you know, Frankie, he's not long gone since, he's, he's now in glory with Jesus mobster from chicago turned millionaire in vegas my mom leads him to the lord on his deathbed he is in heaven can you imagine anybody it's never too late to give your life to the lord he pays for an entire week in kiowa island with my family so all of the papillardos are out there every the caputos the papillardos everybody out there in kiowa island and my mom i'm probably about my dad wasn't there they've been divorced probably i was probably about eight nine I said about eight, nine, nine, ten, eleven. My sister was in love with Dalip. Dalip she met at the beach. So she was probably about eleven. So, you know, she had that puppy dog crush on some guy that, you know, worked at the at the uh, inner tube in the, the jet ski shack. Well, my mom thought that it would be a wonderful idea for her and her son of eight or nine years old to rent a catamaran. Because that's what a lot of unexperienced sailors do as we go out on their first journey and rent a catamaran. So my mom said, hey, sounds like a great idea. And I'm, you know, eight years old, nine years old. I'm like, yeah, sounds like a great idea. Let's do it, mom. We get this catamaran. They give us the 50-second tour of the catamaran, how to do this, la, la, la. He's talking about ropes and sails and, you know, riggings and all these things. And I'm like, yeah, whatever. I hope you're getting all this, mom, because all I do is want to get out in the water. And we jump on this catamaran and we go out to sea. Now, I don't know if you've ever been out on the sea, but conditions can change like that. They have these flags that kind of show you riptides. Some of them show you wind velocities. And so it can go from green to yellow to red in a flash. And we're out there. We're having a ball. I mean, this catamaran is flying through the ocean you know it does one of these things and i'm you know all of my 60 pounds is trying to keep the the boat from tipping over my mom's laughing we're all having a great time you know yeah and we're just getting further and further and further out to sea and i, I think 30 minutes has gone by we're just being taken by the wind wherever it goes and before i knew it i could not see any resemblance or semblance of land None. And, you know, at this point I'm thinking, this might not have been such a good idea. That sail was like, <laughs> and we were like, I never saw, I didn't think a boat could go that fast. I mean, the pontoon boat, Jay, this thing was like, just flying out to sea. And I lost all reference of land. And so my hope now, I'm like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? And then at eight years old, you know what comes into my mind? <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Don't, ever, don't ever let your kids watch Jaws at an early age and then decide to take them on a catamaran out to open sea 
with no experience. I mean, we're, we're out there flying back and forth. I'm just waiting for the Coast Guard, you know, the helicopters, the airplane. I've lost all hope. I can't see the land. I'm lying down on that little piece. What is that, like a four by eight sheet of silk cloth that they give you to keep you from, you know, utter death, the ocean? And I'm flying over and I'm laying down trying to keep the boat from going like this. And my mom's laughs are now turning into cries. And I'm like, how do we get back? And I couldn't see anything. The waves were going up, and I'm down, so my field of vision was very narrow and small. I couldn't see anything. And all of a sudden, she screams, Land ho! And I thought I was on the boat with Columbus, but you know, it was my mom. And so she says, Turn that way! And I did. I grabbed that rudder thing, and I went, Whoosh! And that boat, whoosh. I mean, we were flying. I don't mean to like, you know, glorify this, but we were flying out to the middle of nowhere. And the minute that I saw the land, I was like just dead laser locked on it. My hope now was set on getting back to that land, which I could see with my own two eyes. Mama didn't have to tell me about it. I saw it, and so I settled in my heart of hearts. That is where I am going, and I made straight run for land. And we get there, and the boat comes up on the, on the, uh, the shore, and the wind is whipping so bad, the, the boat's going like this. And I'm like hanging on to it. And this thing's getting ready to take off. And the guys at the, you know, the boat shack, I don't know if they were thinking, what did we do? We're going to get sued. But they were like... And I'm like, I don't have a lawnmower. It's a boat. Are you as crazy as I am? What does this mean? And as the guys are running, getting closer, through the wind I could hear them, release the sail and I'm like what he's like release the sail and the sail was stuck in its rigging the the teeth that keep it tight all I had to do was pop it and I did and that would have stopped us from going out to sh out to sea it also saved us from flipping over the minute I popped that sail boom the boat settled down the sail was just flapping there the wind had nothing to do with us but that's what Peter's saying have your hope settled in Jesus Christ. Make sure your hope is settled in nothing else than Jesus because that's what will rescue you, that's what will save you, and that's what will sustain you when persecution comes your way or the world says, do A, B, and C, and Christ says, no, do D, E, and F. It's much better. Have your hope settled today. In Christ. Remember, he didn't stand, he didn't make you to stand um, in with the world or to fit in. He made you to stand out. Romans 12, chapter 2, or chapter 12, verse 2 says, Do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be ye transformed. Be transformed. And that word is from the inside out. Don't be conformed like a cupcake going into a mold. Don't be conformed by the mold of this world. Be ye transformed from the inside out. Changed. How? By the renewing of your mind. Get into the word of God which you have placed your hope in to save you. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Who wants to be normal anyway? You know, do you want just a normal preacher up here? Oh, blend in, you know, do this, pray a little more. No, normal. What does the world scream as normal? Get divorced. Do what you want to do. Don't wait till you're married to engage with your wife or your future wife in this. Be anxious, fearful, worry. Do all these things. That's normal for the world. Who wants to be normal? We are called to be different. We have the answers to life, the abundant life with Christ died to give us. The enemy comes to make you normal. He wants to kill, steal, and destroy everything that Christ wants to give you so that you can stay the course and be different. Who wants normal? Stay the course. Don't look like the world all fearful anxious worried doing whatever they want to do divorce rates through the roof you know many christians compromise and they do all these things don't stay the course you're called to be different matthew 7 13 says enter through the n -n -n narrow gate the narrow gate for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction and many enter through this broad road and gate 
But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. How do you know you're on the narrow road headed towards the narrow gate? It's a lonely road. You might be on it by yourself. Not everybody's joining with you. The world is on the road and path to destruction headed right for that gate. And many are ushered into it unbeknownst to them with the devil laughing. Ha, 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 ha. But you said if I, no, ha, 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 ha. You don't care. Few find the narrow road and the narrow gate. Blessed are you who have found and believed. Amen? Amen. Stay the course let me just pray real quick that um, the Holy Spirit would convict us I think we need a little more conviction of the Holy Spirit we like a lot of word that can be wooden and dry you know there's a lot of people that want a lot of spirit that could be you know flopping around and kind of out of out of sorts and chaotic and uh, all things go but we want to blend these together we want to ask the truth of God, to take the truth of his word and to blend it with the power of the spirit that he would convict us to be different. Father, I thank you for your word and Holy Spirit, I am asking that you would help us to be different. Father, we're not perfect, but we are different than this world. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would have your way with us. Holy Spirit, move amongst us and draw us to the truth that you would have us to see for the situations that we face that we should be radically different as we live for you, in Jesus' name. There was a time that I was stupid. Anybody ever been there? I was probably, I don't know, a few years back, I was making wooden arrows with my son, Elijah. I think my wife remembers this. We were in the backyard. Elijah thought it would be great. I mean, Elijah is like the inventor of all things. He wants to just make, make things. So I said, hey, let's... Let's make a bow and arrow set. He's like, yeah, bow and arrow set. I should have went to Toys R Us and not been the chief skate because it would have saved me a lot of pain to come. But I said, let's collect some sticks. We made a little bow. Now we needed the arrows. So what did we do? We started to whittle these arrows with, you know, not like uh, an arrow making device. I thought the box cutter blade from Home Depot would be just enough to suffice for these little sticks. And so I began to shape an arrow. Now let me just suggest to you that you never pull a knife towards your body. Even if being attacked, you want to thrust it into somebody else's body. So therefore, look, you don't ever pull a knife towards your body. I began to whittle these arrows with a knife that I should not have been using. And as I began to do it, it went right into my thumb so far that I could only see the very top of that nice Stanley razor-sharp blade sticking out of the top of my thumb as blood began to <laughs> spray out of my thumb. I don't know what happened first. Did I drop the knife, grab my thumb, or did the profanities begin to come out of my mouth? And I say that because I'm not perfect. But I think I had to explain to my seven-year-old that we were duck hunting because some of the words that came out of my mouth. And he looked at me as blood ran down my hand. And I said some words that I, I regret. I wish I could take them back. But the point is that it was in me, those words. And the pain brought those words out. And it's not that I just want to look different on the outside because I don't do certain things, behavior modification. I want to be transformed on the inside so that no matter what pressure or pain I come underneath, my inside speaks of the King of Kings. For out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Does that mean I was lost? No. I just wasn't living for Jesus. I just wasn't being transformed by the renewing of my mind. So as the world went, so I went. But God is calling us to a higher road. He's calling us to be different. 
And so why does this matter? Because 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 14 says, As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. There was a time that you lived in ignorance and lived according to what your flesh wanted, and you did whatever the evil desires that popped in your mind. You did them. You said them. You went there. You treated them that way. God says, do not do that. As obedient children, don't conform. Don't be pressed by this evil age to have evil desires that you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all that you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. He doesn't want you just to look like a Pharisee on the outside. He wants you as obedient children to live a life worthy of your calling and to be transformed from the inside out. But there's this tension in the world. Have you ever heard it? God doesn't really call me to be holy. He wants me to be happy. You know, my, the kids are out. The, we raised them well. They're, they're off to college. They've got great jobs. Don't you think that God wants me to be happy, to live the way that I want to live? Truly, God doesn't want me to be all this holier than thou. Isn't it my time? Doesn't he want me to be happy? He's just called me to be happy, to be happy in all that I do. Well, a lot of us under that kind of notion believe that God's high calling on our life is truly our happiness. That is not God's high calling on our life. His high calling on our life is to be holy, which is hagios, which means to be set apart, separate, and pure unto the Lord for service and use to Him and to other people as dearly loved children, used as an instrument of righteousness, not an instrument of unrighteousness. So if you're under the, the notion that, you know what, I just need to be happy, let me just run some things by you. The theology of happiness does something. When you buy into the world's ideologies of, oh, you just, just do it. Just do it, Josh, man. It'll be, if it makes you happy, just do it. Your wife won't know. And you know what? She's just been too mean to you. Just live. Be happy for once in your life. I can't believe you put up with this for so long. Sure, just do it. What? No one's going to know. When we buy into the theology of just be happy, it empowers us to personal justification so i'm not happy allows me to do things that would otherwise be what sinful and wrong and would glorify things that god died on the cross to free us from that's the theology of oh it's all about me it's about me being happy I get to justify everything I want to do, say, go, be around, and entrench myself in. That is a man's standard. Just be happy. Not happy in my marriage, what do I do? I punch. There's plenty of women out there or men out there. Don't like my kids? Give up on them. You know what? Kick them out when they're 17. Get them out of the house. I took my kids who, I, I don't ever recommend this. See, I'm, I'm not perfect, okay? So I'm going to talk to the non-perfect section over here. I took my kids in Houston one time, one time, to a, a Lamborghini dealer. Kind of cool, right? We walked in. They said hi to us. <laughs> that, that was about it. Nobody came over to see if I would, was thinking about buying this $328,000 Lamborghini. It was puke baby blue. I couldn't even believe it. $328,000 for a car that sits idle for 98% of the time you own it. And you got to pay, what, $50,000, $60,000 on taxes a year on that bad boy? Give me a break. Then there was the, the Bugatti. Then there was the Ford GT. And my boys are standing next to it. What would the world say? Do whatever you could to buy that. Do whatever you can. Just buy it. Buy it. Who cares if you go broke? Who cares if your kids can't eat? No. 
That's what the world does. They apply for Discover cards when they don't even have a job and they get a $4,000, $10,000 uh, credit limit and they buy whatever they want because I deserve to be happy like my parents are in their 50s and 60s when they work their whole life. I don't want to work hard my whole life. I want it now. The world says go get it. Get a credit card. Charge it up. Live it up. But the, slave, the borrower is slave to the lender, the Bible says. We do it differently. We live in our means. And so we left that Lamborghini deal, and I got back in my little Honda minivan with 285,000 miles on it that leaks more oil than they got at Quaker State, and I drove home happy. I'm like, boys, was that like going to Disney World? Oh, that was fun, Dad. Good, because you ain't never getting one of those. And don't aspire to get one of those. You see how they treated us in there? They wouldn't even come up and say hi to us. Buy one of their cars. Never. Even if I could afford it. But I can't. And even if I could, I tell my boys, boys, do not get stuck in the trappings of this world. It's not worth it. Everything passes away. Young ones, dating, everybody's going to tell you, you know what? Oh, he loves me. He loves me. He loves me. If he loves you, he's going to keep his hands off you. He's not going to force you to do anything that you don't want to do. He's going to give you dignity and respect. He's going to wait to even kiss, touch anything until you are married. Why? Because I am a man of God. And I am following a higher calling. And it is not about me being happy. It's about me being holy. Those happy days are going to come. It's called honeymoon. Amen? Amen. Have all, go at it, man. Have triplets. You know, whatever you want to do. But wait. You're radically different. I'm sweating now, honey. Woo. All right. I thought it was because I'm nine minutes over, but we're going to keep on rolling. All right. Let me just take this off because we're really going to get going now. We're talking about some honeymoons. No. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. All right, Lord, separate and holy. I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs> okay. So, um, think about this. When you believe that God wants you to be holy or happy instead of holy, what happens when discomfort and delays, suffering all come into place? What do you think? You don't think that God's got your best interest, so you start to live for yourself. Holiness has no root in your life. And you begin to be mad at God. Well, certainly, I'm supposed to be happy, so why is all of these, why is there persecution? Why is there this discomfort? Why, 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 Lord? Well, God does not exist to serve us, right? Amen? We exist to serve God. God wants us to be holy, not simply joyful. Forget the happiness because that's, that's dictated by how the happenings around you are going. If everything's good, you're happy. God wants to give you joy and joy unspeakable. And that comes from settling your hope on Christ and living for Him, shooting for the high mark of holiness. And in doing that, you will be satisfied and joy-filled as a believer in Christ. Set apart. So those of you parents, instilling in your kids, willing to look different, that they should wait to kiss even until they get married, let alone have physical relationships. You're going to look different. You're going to be ostracized. Along the way, people are going to throw stones at you for desiring to be different. Stay the course because you are there to set the example for your children. Your children will never follow the ways of God, especially if they do not see a tenacious desire in the family and the parents to serve God themselves. You are setting the standard in a sense, and your lowest standard will always be the highest standard they shoot for so they can say, well, Daddy, you did it. I was just following you. So you've got to stay the course and follow holiness as your standard in the Lord. That might be where you look different. Maybe you don't watch the, the MA Netflix channel movies. You don't watch the R-rated movies. Does that send you to hell? No, it doesn't. But it shows your children you are shooting for a higher standard, the standard of God. I know up here in the north people like to drink. Does drinking send you to hell? No, but maybe you need to stand out and instead of going to the restaurant and grabbing a few cocktails, not getting drunk with your meal and then getting in the car, maybe you should say no because I am wholly different than the world. One drink can turn into five. Before you know it, you're all getting back in the car 
driving home. That's the example. I've seen men chop down bedroom doors with axes because of just one or two drinks while the kids scream from the top floor of their house, call the police. You should be different. 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 And so you might ask, well, why does it matter? Well, it matters because he who called you is holy. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in the last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him and so your faith and hope are in God. Be holy because I am holy. Why should we be set apart? Because God, your Savior, who gave his life as the one and only perfect Lamb of God said to do it. That's pretty good, isn't it? It's not about me. It's because of who he is and what he has done. You know, the enemy prowls around like a roaring lion, does he not? First Peter chapter 5 is going to tell us that. It's going to tell us to be sober-minded, self-controlled, and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Stand firm in the faith. You know, the devil's been doing this for a long time, and he even gets it on me sometimes. He's been telling Adam and Eve the very same thing he whispers in your ear when you want to be set apart and different from the world. He says, you know what? Josh, did God really say that you can't think about it? God loves you. God's a God that would let you do whatever you want. He wants you to be happy. Did God really say that you can't look at that? Did he really say you can't think that? Did he really say you can't take? Did, Did God really say that you can't do that? In the minute you do it, just like Eve, he wants you to deny the goodness of God. He wants you to be self-consumed, and he wants you to trip right into it. Do not fall for the trap of the enemy. It's interesting because it's easy to fall into temptation, right? Do you ever see anybody fall into righteousness? Up, just, whoa gosh I just happened to look at that and fell right into righteousness no the enemy is always out to get you to fall away from following the Lord and it's by his power that he keeps you it's his, by his power that he helps you conform to his ways not the world's ways by transforming you by the renewing of your mind he says be ye holy not just by behavior modification on the outside but by spiritual transformation on the inside living holy isn't the path to knowing christ knowing christ is the path to living holy if you are not living a holy life or going in that direction chances are you are not in christ i pray today that you would have a settled hope that you would be willing to live differently and know for certain beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are his kept by him as you're on your journey to heaven if you do not have your hope settled in christ come talk with one of us pastors today and we can point you in the way of eternal life his name is jesus christ amen amen Amen. god bless you all for listening thank you for um listening to the holy spirit let me just pray for us as we close out and sing our last song father we do thank you for the opportunity just to yield ourselves to you again jesus this is about you and not us holy spirit continue the work that you're doing right now of convicting us of the sins that so easily entangle us that we've justified to do in order to be happy god call us holy spirit call us and conform us to holiness that we might be a usable vessel a loving vessel and a serving vessel for the King of Kings. In Jesus' name, amen.